a bit later and I've got that there as well. So we're going to kick off nice and promptly. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, this is a new Nicotine Alliance meeting, um, uh, totally separate from GFN. Um, and it's to discuss the future of tobacco harm reduction policy in the UK, seeing as we're so blessed over here compared with the rest of the world. Um, but we still think it needs improvement, so we're going to talk about that today. Um, with the WHO and the EU posing big threats to both vaping and other reduced risk, risk nicotine products, 2021 is a crucial year for tobacco harm reduction. The appalling EU SCIA report seems written purely to enable the EU Commission to exact revenge for being outmaneuvered by vaping consumers <laughs> and representatives such as, <laughs> such as Rebecca with TBD2. Noises in advance of the next review seems to show that the EU wishes to re rewind to 2011 and try again to prohibit or severely restrict safer products. The WHO is even more of a threat, openly calling for prohibition and abandoning science and evidence while, as is customary, ignoring the public entirely. Instead, they're listening to a loud echo chamber of lobbyists, many of whom openly funded by millions of dollars of Bloomberg cash. So will the UK's world-leading stance on tobacco harm reduction be threatened? Will this country feel pressure to move away from the policies such as endorsing e-cigarettes cigarettes for smokers looking to quit that have worked so well, or will the UK stick to its guns on harm reduction in the coming years? Indeed, could we even see our sensible approach spread influence in the opposite direction? And as always, what should we as consumers be doing to ensure that our policymakers make the right decisions? Um, we have a lovely panel here with Clive Bates. Um, uh, I think everyone knows used to be um, director of ASH, was yeah. he? Director of ASH, uh, has worked in number 10 and, um, and on a number of issues. Um, I don't think he needs much interaction, but thanks for him coming. Rebecca Taylor. Uh, was former Liberal Democrat uh, Demo, Lib, and P, MEP for Yorkshire and Humber. Yorkshire, Yorkshire and Humber. Um, and she, she fought very hard on TPD2 to stop yeah. e cigarettes being on it, turned yeah. into medicinal devices. So we, we're eternally grateful for her, so it'd be interesting to get her role. And Mark Oates, Director of WeVape and the Snooze Users Association. Um, okay. Shall we start with you, Mark? Because sure. we had an announcement from Jo Churchill just last week, wasn't it? Mm. That she's going to be embarking on a review of SNUS, which is currently illegal in this country and across the EU apart from Sweden. What, what are your thoughts on that? Do you, and what, what are your thoughts and what maybe are your fears of what it could be at the same time? Well, I mean, I think it's fantastic that we're considering righting the wrongs of the past. Um, and SNUS is, for me, a litmus test. We've obviously got the Smoke Free 2030 ambition, and I think we need to be doing that if we're going to achieve it, because um, smokers need a smorgasbord of options. It's not just about vaping. Vaping's fantastic, but it's not for everyone. And um, sometimes people say to me, well, do we need to legalize SNUS because we've got nicotine pouches? But um, you know, I, I talk with a lot of consumers of snooze and nicotine pouches regularly. There's probably, on my calculations, around 100,000 in the UK, looking at how many people, um, the sales of people um, that I've seen. And a lot of them say, you know, they're either maybe in the preference camp of snooze or the preference camp of uh, nicotine pouches. Uh, in many ways, the best analogy would be maybe snooze is like real ale and nicotine pouches are like cider. You know? Um, so it, it is vitally important that we make that change. Um, I myself have preference for the snooze. And Martin, you prefer nicotine pouches. Um, and then beyond that, if we manage to achieve that legalisation, we need to actually work on public awareness. And that's more broadly an issue with things like heat not burn, uh, with nicotine pouches and with um, snooze, because the public just aren't aware of these other options that exist. Um, I think nicotine pouches will probably be okay because they're allowed to advertise, but there we find the biggest flaw with our rules is that if something's got tobacco in, you can't advertise it. If it's not, you can. And really, it should be combustion versus non-combustion. But whether we can persuade the government to um, make such a bold change, I don't know, but we should try because it's actually going to be one of the few things that helps us get to smoke free 2030. Okay, just to touch on Joe Churchill and, uh, and how she, I mean, she's always spoken fairly um, positively about e-cigarettes, but last week in the uh, Westminster Hall debate, she said in reply to uh, MP David Jones, who spoke about e-cigarettes and heated tobacco products, 
She said, as my mother and her friend said, we have to go at the things hard if we are to see that success. I assure everyone that we are considering alternative products in the plan insofar as there are alternatives to the plan being the tobacco control plan. Mm. Uh, and she also said, it is vital we continue to support interventions that make the most difference, helping people to cease smoking and encouraging them to move to less harmful products. She seems to be there kind of embracing other products apart from e-cigarettes. Um, your former researcher in, in Parliament, Westminster, what would you take from this kind of softening? Do you think there's something moving there? I hope so. I mean, I think I've been getting parliamentary questions asked on Snooze, for example, for quite a while. And last year we had a neutral answer, which to some people I spoke to uh, was a bad thing, but actually compared to a negative answer. So I was very positive. But then about six months ago we had a negative answer. But then obviously this review came up. Um, it's hard to tell what the thing behind the scenes because I know that Joe, Church Joe Churchill was in an APBG meeting um, the week, uh, a few days before the debate, and in that she wasn't as positive um, on uh, reducing its products as from what I saw. So it was pleasing to see her in the, the uh, Westminster Hall debate being more positive. Um, just quickly on fears, um, and this comes to the suggestions that the sort of uh, APBG on smoking and health suggested. Um, as we get nearer and nearer the year 2030, my worry is that if we haven't made the decisions now to push for harm reduction, the government is going to reach for the easiest lever it can that it knows, and it's just going to do tobacco control mm -hmm. and bully and uh, attack smokers. And it won't work, and we won't achieve uh, smoking in 2030. So we need to be acting now. We need to encourage the government to make changes now. OK, thanks, Mark. Um, Rebecca, we were talking last night. Uh, I'd read it on the train on the way up about this new organisation, TIGA. Yeah, the, 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 the task force. Task yeah. force for innovation. Something. Task force for innovation, growth and regulatory reform. Um, so it literally um, produced its report like the day before yesterday, so I haven't had a chance. Well, it's 130 pages. I have not read all of it. <laughs> um, but it sort of gives an idea, because I think Martin had asked me before, you know, what, what do you think in terms of like ongoing UK EU, EU negotiations is this something where the government would want to diverge? And I think, well, there hasn't really been a clear strategy, so I don't know. Um, but I think to justify diverging, there has to be a case made and a big prize to gain in that respect. Um, because it does involve work, new regulatory regimes, legislation, putting it through Parliament, there is a sort of, the resources involved there. In terms of the task force report, the overall approach, it aligns really well with the letter that NNA sent to the Department of Health in March, particularly proportionality. So the report proposes like a new proportionality principle based on risks and outcomes. And they say we want to keep a high level of consumer and environmental protection and regulation that supports SMEs and startups. But in terms of their focus areas, there is one on targeted reform of EU regulations, but it's quite way down the list. In terms of sort of areas where they're really interested, it's, it's the high tech science focused, it's fintech, digital health, AI, nutraceuticals, where you know you can imagine ministers doing a nice photo call snip, here's the new science park, it's 500 highly skilled jobs here. I think that that is what they're looking for. But in terms of how they want to regulate, this fits really well. Proportionate, forward-looking, outcomes-focused, collaborative, responsive, you know, as in to, to SMEs and market development. But, yeah, I think what's going to be the challenge is the prioritisation. Because I think it's going to be something ministers are not going to be like, oh, this is a really bad idea. This can be like, well, I've got 15 other ideas ahead of it. Mm. Um, and that also brings me to the other barrier, and this is more on the health policy side, is that, that nothing is going to have a higher priority than dealing with the COVID healthcare backlog. I work for Endometriosis UK, a women's health charity. We represent the one and a half million in the UK who have endometriosis. And also remember here, just a little flag, healthcare is devolved. So the Department of Health is only responsible for England. They're not responsible for health policy in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, it, it's, a, it's a challenge and a cost that just dwarfs everything else. I mean, we hear from women who have had surgery postponed or cancelled, sometimes postponed several times, surgery that they desperately need because they're in pain and discomfort, okay, endometriosis is not fatal. Um, and we hear from clinicians who have so little clinic time, they don't even know how they're going to get through their urgent case backlog 
never mind all the rest. So I think right now the bar to sort of, you have to reach a higher bar to get that government attention. I think that is going to be the challenge. Not that you're not aligned, that we wouldn't be aligned with how the government kind of sees their future regulatory approach. And that means how easy are the changes going to be to make? What's work needed to define define them, draft, you know, draft proposals, or civil service drafting proposals, getting them through Parliament. The report does talk about um, increased scrutiny, which is a good thing, because there's been a lot of removal of parliamentary scrutiny recently. Zero for the Australian trade deal, none whatsoever. Um, so I think that's a good thing, because that's what Parliament is supposed to do, to scrutinise uh, legislation. But that does take time, doing it properly takes time. And then stakeholder support or opposition, as Mark mentioned, you know, sometimes neutral is fine, and in this case, just somebody not opposing is probably okay. You don't necessarily need their support, but you need them not to oppose. And then look at what is going to be gained in terms of health and also in terms of economic growth, because that's what this agenda is looking for. I think the health case, levelling up health inequalities, is really, really easily made. I think the economic growth jobs is more difficult. Okay. I can ask you a question, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite fearful of what you're going to say <laughs> in reply, I would say. Um, another thing that happened last week was the ASH All-Party Parliamentary Group came out with a report, and one of their recommendations, I mean, there were a few positives, some things a bit strange, but one said the UK should take its place on the world stage as a leader in tobacco control. Yeah. Um, how, how do you think we as consumers can try and press on politicians to take the world stage as a leader in harm reduction rather than to tobacco make it control? Broader. Or are they just going to go into tobacco control and, mm -hmm. and just ride rough over Well, time? I think part of that is Ash probably constrain themselves in mm -hmm. that, you know, they can't be too radical. You know, I know from my discussions, I know, I know, I know from my discussions before with Ash about the TPDs, they were horrified by the WHO approach, but really worried of getting the WHO as an enemy because they thought that would be really, really harmful. It's not ideal. <laughs> That's kind of what I was pushing yeah. at, is, is yeah. you know, we'd like the UK to go to COP9 in November yeah. and, and push harm reduction to yeah. the rest of the world. But is there, it, would they see it as a safe option to just go along with a herd and just think, well, we, we don't have to listen to everything yeah. they say, let's just let them talk and about all, it. And also, work tobacco work. control is understood, well understood even by the general public, mm. whereas tobacco harm reduction isn't as well understood. Mm. So, uh, that there is, gosh, there is public engagement. So this is why I said I was fearful of the answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew you could say something like that. Loads of work. Yeah. <laughs> Loads of work. But I, I, I think that yeah. drawing a distinction between tobacco control and public health is useful. Because yeah. you can see tobacco harm reduction as a public health yeah, strategy, absolutely. whereas tobacco control, it's in the name. It's on. It's it's you know it is what it says. It's 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 punitive. It's coercive. It's restrictions. It's essentially trying to bear down on something, whereas the tobacco harm reduction is an opportunity to do things differently yeah. that has a public health dividend. Yeah. And for me, that's the distinction that the consumers need to make mm. is that they have a public health agenda, not a tobacco control agenda. Yeah, I think the public health case is the, the stronger one to make, especially on the health inequalities. I mean, it's really quite clear. Um, so let's just revisit for anyone who doesn't know that the NNA wrote to the government, and we'll bring Clive in on this. We wrote to the government and uh, number 10 uh, twice about proposals that we had. Uh, first one up front and centre was lift the ban on snooze. Should be a no brainer. We think so anyway. Um, we hope, we're hoping this review comes out with something. Um, Changing rules on advertising, raising the nicotine concentration limits on vaping products, get rid of the silly warnings, really silly, pointless, and irrelevant warnings in some respects. Uh, allow. In my defence, we had to put those in because we couldn't get through Parliament otherwise. <laughs> well, well, I, just, I didn't know that before. We talked yeah. about that. Um, yeah. Allow communication of relative risk. Uh, abolish this uh, re restriction on tank and liquid container sizes and uh, allow pack inserts for guiding government to harm reduction product. Um, in, in all that we've had last week, Clyde, with comments from Joe Churchill, the yeah, ASH, APBG and what have you, how do you think our proposals 
uh, are looking now in light of recent developments just in the last week? Well, Martin, absolutely brilliant, to be honest. <laughs> I think they're astonishingly good and the answer to all of our prayers. Is that, is that okay? Um, but is, so there, let, let, is there a movement you let, think, let towards me, that sort of yeah, thing? Yeah, let, let's take a step back here. I mean, first, first thing to say is the government has set a very useful target, which is, which is the smoke-free 2030 target, which is to get smoking, smoking prevalence, not tobacco prevalence, nicotine prevalence, smoking prevalence below 5% by 2030. That is an ambitious goal. It requires, um, in the current decade, it requires a two-thirds drop in smoking prevalence, round numbers, two-thirds drop in smoking prevalence. In the last decade, we had a one-third drop in smoking prevalence. So more or less, we have to do twice as much, probably with a harder population to deal with. You know, the, yeah. the people who are more, you know, more homeless, yeah. more mental illness, blah, blah, blah. So it's really, really... With health services and... Uh, exactly, really, really tough. Underserved groups. We also have a couple of um, very helpful developments in the sense that the government, uh, not that I agree with this, but the government has taken us out of the European Union and needs to show that that can actually do something um, that isn't, you know, restarting a war in Northern Ireland or putting the fishing industry out of business. So we have we have Brexit, and you know, Brexit has to, Brexit deregulation, and this is where the Tigger thing comes in. Brexit has to show some dividends, and we have an agenda here that is actually quite positive from a Brexit point of view. There are things that you can do that will make a difference using flexibilities under Brexit. Second thing that the government has is the levelling up agenda. And this agenda that we've put forward here as the New Nicotine Alliance is very much about dealing with health inequalities. It, it basically deals with two things, um, harms to health that are, in, uh, that are unequally di divided along the, the way that smoking prevalence is unequally divided, but also the economic hit from tobacco taxation. So if you can move people away from paying the tax on cigarettes into vaping, they also puts money in the household budget. So I think there's a leveling, good, strong leveling up agenda. The third thing I think I would say is that the, the, the agenda that you've set out there is properly radical. Uh, it requires um, the people who work in tobacco control and public health to rethink their basic assumptions and realign their regulatory um, their sort of, if you like, their regulatory geometry around combustion versus non-combustion rather than tobacco versus non-tobacco or whatever. And therefore, it's open-minded about smokeless tobacco, about snus, about heated tobacco products as much as it is about vaping. And that requires groups like ASH, the Royal College of Physicians, all the people that hate the tobacco industry to rethink their basic approach around combustion. Fourth thing I'd say is that the agenda put forward by the established tobacco control groups is about as thin as water. I mean, the idea that you can take that curve of smoking prevalence and double the rate at which it's dipping by putting silly warnings on cigarettes, by changing the age, which would probably never happen uh, because we have a more sophisticated view of the age of majority in Britain, by you know, basically medicalizing the problem even more and trying to get people through, you know, the NHS into treatment rather than the tobacco harm reduction approach, which is to get them to switch their, you know, if you like, one pleasure for another, at much reduced risk, is, is you know, it's just, they're, they're not serious. They're doing what they find comforting, comfortable. They're not doing what's needed. And that, again, I think is something that consumers have a very strong pitch on. We're talking about what's doing what's needed to meet the target. They're talking about doing what they find comfortable and conventional. And then the final thing I, I think uh, I would say, the fifth thing, is there's a lot of opportunity here. There's the Tigger, there's the, there's the whole uh, engagement with ministers and officials and advisors over, well, what are you doing with Brexit? We've got an idea on levelling up. Um, there's a lot of open doors that we're pushing at and a, a well-organised consumer organisation and the small business associations, um, you know, the vaping businesses. There's a, there's a lot of open doors to push at. So we have got some scope here um, through allies in, in Parliament 
to really push this agenda forward. It's not like we're just banging our heads against the wall and there's nothing to do. It's not going to happen without pushing. It does need advocacy and activism on the part of you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of vapors and you know, dozens of small businesses. But that is definitely doable and winnable. And also, final point, I think, we can get the UK to take a more assertive approach in um, WHO, but it won't happen by default. They, they, they will take the, the easy path of least resistance and just have some red lines, and as long as no one crosses them, then nothing will happen. But if they're pushed to be more assertive about this, I think they will be more assertive. So I, I think there's everything to play for. There's a lot of very good preconditions in place for some success here. The tobacco control community are not totally hostile to harm reduction, but they're not prepared to do what they need to do. And they, I think we can do some boxing with them. Yeah. Um, and I do think it's winnable. We could see a really good buy. Take, really take the point is start now. If you start trying to get, you know, get to the 2030 target in 2028, you've already lost. And that's what's happened in Ireland and New Zealand, where they had 2025 targets. They're now either they're going to miss them by miles or they're going to try and introduce desperate measures which won't work. So yeah, I think it's all good. I'll, 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 I'll ask you the same. On levelling up, I think, because the government hasn't really got any sort of concrete plans there at all. It's just been an electoral slogan. So they need ideas, because I haven't seen anything concrete. I mean, even if you ask apparently Tory MPs, they don't know what it means. So there is there's certainly an opportunity there because they yeah they need some people to come up with ideas and mm. if you package something you go. Okay, Claude, I'll obviously kind of the same as I, I asked Rebecca. Mm. Um, these comments from Joe Churchill. Do you yeah. think in Whitehall there is kind of a little shift towards harm reduction? Are they sort of is it something they're looking at more closely yeah. or is all or these just are we not are we misreading the signs? Do you think no, something's I, going I, on there? No, I think there's there's Twitching in the comatose body. There's a, you know, there's a flicker in the eyelids. Um, there's, you know, there's a sign of a pulse. Um, I mean, I, I think the problem is if they come out with a tobacco control plan um, that obviously won't meet the 2030 target, they're going to look like idiots. Yeah. So they need new thinking, but they also need to do something that brings in their Brexit and levelling up agenda. And we, we basically put forward a set of proposals, all totally doable. They just require some political courage to do them. I mean, it's not like we we sat down and thought, well, that here's a whole load of other ideas that would work really well, but we can't say them because there's no political space. I think that is a really good agenda. I mean, we never considered things like reduce nicotine or... Um, you know, just closing down all the retailers or any of those things, because they, I think that the tobacco control agenda, there's a kind of diminishing returns on that. Yeah. You know, you can only raise the tax so far, or you get into brutally regressive things. You know, all advertising is banned. Uh, there's plain packaging. There's uh, gr gruesome warnings. I mean, how much further can you even take that? Um, and yet, it's not, it's not getting the deep cuts, for example, that we've seen in Sweden where you have a smoking prevalence of 5% entirely because there are alternatives on the market. So we have proof of concept that getting down to that level is possible uh, because we've seen it in Sweden, but it won't work through the, you know, the, 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 the sort of just the, the force of regulation from tobacco control because people just push back against that. Um, I'll ask one last thing of, of all of you, um, because I was quite pleased with this. Another thing Joe Churchill said was she acknowledged the 95% less harmful figure, which must have been a, a knife in the back of the key. Um, well, uh, Martin and I have agreed to disagree a long time ago. Yeah, and, um, and, and she said we recommit to our evidence approach to e-cigarettes. Now, that kind of locks in e-cigs. Yeah. almost for good in this country. Mm -hmm. And we kind of have cross-party support in Parliament about that. Um, so how long do you think before we can get that same sort of commitment and cross-party support for other products? Do you want us to see? Go on, let's be fanciful. Be f Me? Yeah, think for the future. Think well, I your mean, rose tinted glasses on. I mean, public what? awareness of nicotine pouches and snooze and heat not burn in Parliament is abysmal, just as it is in yeah. the country. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there needs to be some work on that. And, and in truth, the government isn't going to do it. It's, um, 
it's, I think the government needs to release industry to spend its revenue on maybe even independent statements. Um, but currently they're being held back. Um, just to be a bit positive perhaps about the 2030, um, I know 2035 in Scotland, but um, there was public perception of vaping. I think smokers think, 60% of smokers think that vaping is as harmful as smoking. Mm. And there's a study, a study done that suggested, I think for every 1%, that meant that 0.6 didn't uh, switch. Mm. So that comes to around 2.5 million smokers that are currently out there. Um, they think that vaping isn't safer, so they're not making the switch. Mm. And then, so that, that's a huge number. Then Ethra did a fantastic survey. Um, it was brilliant. And I think three tenths of smokers in the EU, including Britain, said they would try snooze if it was legalized. That's again, it's around 2.4 million smokers. And then you've got the fact that there's loads of people out there that potentially, they might have tried vaping, didn't fit with them, but they don't even know that he not burn exists. So it really is achievable. And I'm positive about it, but it's got to make the government's actually got to pull their finger for their, pull their finger out and actually do something, and not just go along with what they've got at the moment. Not stick with the TPD, but you know as hard as you worked on it to change it for the better. But you have to make compromises, otherwise it, it will be worse. Do you, do you, worse. Do, you <laughs> Brett, do you want to say anything before we go to some questions? If we've got um, any questions. No, just just to um, sort of. Um, second what Mark said about the public awareness thing because that was something we definitely came across with vaping um, even though in this country we've got for example PHE and the RCP have actually been pretty good on this um, John Britton yeah so he's the person you want to be speaking to it's Nottingham now I think He's yeah. actually retired. Oh, is he just retired? Emeritus. Is it emeritus? Well, they might have some time. You Sounds know. even more grand. <laughs> they might have some time. I mean, but I, th I think that public awareness is there because I'm constantly amazed by, or was, by people who thought like vaping was as harmful as smoking or even more harmful. <laughs> no, you're kidding. And I think, you know, politicians are aware of what the public thinks on these things and they don't want to be seen as like baddies. Um, so I think there, there is a lot to be done on the sort of public awareness, public engagement, and you're right, good morning, you're doing that. I, I, I think people make their decisions about um, you know, whether they're going to smoke or switch or quit. In, in a kind of ecosystem of, of, uh, of influences. And I, I always think of those three environments that face people. There's a fiscal environment. What, what are the taxes on these, on these products? And how, do, how does that create economic incentives to, to change behavior? Then there's a regulatory environment. What does, it, you know, what does it say on the packet, the warning, where it can be sold and all that? And then really important is an information environment. You know, what, what, is, what are people saying about it? What, is, what are the risk communications that are coming through the packet? And we made that proposal, which is a reheat of a Canadian proposal, which is to have a, a series of approved statements that anyone in the field can use that basically our government endorsed correct statements at the category level that would allow people to promote these products uh, in a... Within a in, yeah, within, yeah, within a framework. Not, not that they can just say anything, but they're true statements that this product is substantially less risky than smoking or whatever. Yeah. And I think paying attention to the information environment is really important. It gets down to what do ministers say? What does the chief medical officer say about these things? What, do, what advice, when, it, when you go into your GP as a smoker, what's the brief advice intervention and what is it, what is the nhs incentivized to get your gp to say to you so i think attending to those three environments fiscal regulatory and information simultaneously and sort of changing those through the course of the 2020s will actually get us to the right place by 2030 if it's backed up by good products from the industry and you know it, it, genuine consumer demand i mean you can't make people do this if they don't want to but they do want to and why shouldn't they? It should go well. Yeah. Okay. Right, I we've was, got we've I got the panel it, here. I always find it's useful to compare nicotine to caffeine. Yeah. Because mm. um, no one thinks you want to ban someone having a double espresso. Which has probably got the same <laughs> effect, in fact, probably more in effect. So it's good to I think it's always good to make mm. that comparison. Okay, we've got the panel here and we have an audience um, far away. Ask the panel what what you what you feel like? Has anyone got any questions? So, um, 
it's like the tax on cigarettes and tobacco and tobacco, and tobacco and sin tax. We've seen a trend across Europe to apply the same tax to same products and future yeah. products. Is that, I always wonder, is that because it's, as the regulators do think it's a, a sin because it's nicotine, or is it just because they want to make up some of the revenue they're losing from tobacco? Are you, are you talking about taxation? You're speaking specifically about taxation of, of harm reduced products. Yeah, yeah so yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. introducing yeah. Like mm. a new liquid tax yeah. mm. next year. That's all for you, I think, yeah, I think, I think it's sometimes it's just, it's just laziness mm. to a certain extent. Um, but I always, on that front, I always would say, why would you be, you know, if, if your goal is to stop people smoking, why would you? kind of do a favour to those selling cigarettes. Essentially, you're doing them a favour because you're not allowing the reduced harm products to be kind of more competitive from a price perspective. Um, but I think if, there, if there's not enough attention on that, it's something that bypasses most people, I would say. And if you ask someone, you know, should a, if you sort of explain to someone, man, woman in the street, should, you know, this product's 95% less harmful than smoking. Should it have the same kind of syntax on it and smoking? I think they'd instinctively say no, but most of them have no idea. Because it's only someone who already vapes who would be aware of that, because there would be a change in the, in the price. So. I don't, know if, I don't know if you saw it, but I think it was just last week or very recently that mm. Germany has just passed um, a whole load of um, taxes and they, they've they increased the tax on cigarettes, but the biggest increase have been in e-cigarettes mm -hmm. in Germany. Did, 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 no, you, did you see this too, Mark? Yeah, I mean, what, what I found most frustrating is if you did the same with the environment. Mm -hmm. you know, if you suddenly started taxing electric cars or, you know, the electricity that goes into them, you know, the, the public would be enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, the, the understanding is there. Yeah, so, um, and they'd be out in the streets, they'd be smashing up, you know, public buildings. <laughs> but, um, that we all have ownership in our pensions, you know, smashing shell officers. Um, and, but when it comes to this, there's not. And so far, I don't think we've seen many deaths from uh, global warming. I think, I think I saw a study that there may be 20 million deaths by 2100. Well, we're looking at a billion for smoking. So yeah. it's a shame that the, that the same understanding can't be had with both. And that's the same for COP9 and mm -hmm. COP26. You know, the amount of effort the government's putting into COP26, being a global leader. Well, why not be a global leader on COP9? Um, also, in international development, uh, tobacco harm reduction should be front and centre. You know, we're, we're putting a huge amount of energy into things like malaria. Why aren't we putting the same effort into something like tobacco harm reduction? Because, really, when you look at when when people are doing uh, cost benefit analysis, you know, you're looking at how many people can you save, mm. and you can actually save a huge amount of people if you push tobacco harm reduction around the world. But they're scared. Yeah. There's a stigma because it's nicotine, and and I think that's that's the same that's happening with uh, taxes on e-liquids. That stigma um, is crossed over onto e-liquids e and vapor. And it's very difficult to change people's minds. Um, they don't understand that nicotine isn't the problem. Um, yeah, yeah just on, on taxes, I just, I think we've got to remember that governments, when they introduce these taxes, really trying to do two, three things. They're, they're trying to raise revenue opportunistically. Mm -hmm. And if there's something unpopular that most of the public thinks is a bad thing, then they can basically get away with it yeah. um, without, you know, who cares? If the revenue's coming from that, and actually it's respectable economically to do that. Why, why would you tax, um, you know, enterprise through corporation tax or, or hard work through income tax when you could tax something like this? But the second thing they're trying to do is to achieve policy objectives. And this is where we do have, we do have leverage now. A lot a lot of people would think, well, you know, first of all, because there's misperceptions of risk, you're okay just to put a quite high tax on it because actually it may be a lesser risk, but it's not much less uh, if it's a, if it's any lower at all. So fair game. You're trying to create a disincentive to vape. What happens though is is the literature is starting to yield interesting results about cross elasticities between um, vaping and smoking. So some very good research coming out in the States now that shows that if you increase the price of um, vaping, you get an increase in the volume of cigarettes sold. Okay, and, and it's because the two markets are coupled, because they function as economic substitutes. 
Now, we haven't won that argument in Europe, and there's very little uh, ever Europe-specific evidence about the interaction between the vaping market and the smoking market, although we're all pretty confident that it's there. Mm -hmm. The sort of economic research hasn't been done. So to me, that's a real high priority to, 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 to get to that. The third thing that we're trying to achieve is to keep the tax system efficient so that the cost of collecting the tax isn't so high compared to the tax actual, actually collected. And again, that works against risk proportionate regulations. If you say, well, the tax must be 95% lower, it's so low it's not worth collecting. So they'll always go for um, you know, like a third or a half or some other objective like that. But the key, I think, is to make the case to the Commission, to the Treasury, to whoever, that the, the coupling of the smoking and vaping or the harm reduction, the smoke-free and the smoke product markets, and that price changes in one causes changes of demand in the other. There's a positive cross-elasticity. And then we can have a sensible conversation about policy objectives. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, you, read, you read out that sort of point um, in the report, and it said something like, if I can recall, you said um, the UK can export its um, yeah, it was uh, a, it was a recommendation by the Ash or Party Parliamentary Group. Um, uh, it was about that the UK can take its place on the world stage as a leader of tobacco control. Yeah. Well, as soon as I heard that, because you know I'm a FCTC aficionado and kind of um, anorak, I suppose. I thought, what is the definition of tobacco control that the in the FCTC? definition of tobacco control, those two words, is um, including supply, demand and harm reduction strategies. And that is the area within the FCTC that, um, that uh, harm reduction is within the context of tobacco control. So I would think this is where I think, you know, putting those arguments to the politicians who the UK has um, ratified this treaty um, and it has obligations to do that. So you bring all that information out. So in the context of tobacco control, yes, it can it, use it to our advantage and how the argument can work for us, not just, you know, the ordinary interpretation of tobacco control. Because if you then extrapolate that through all the things that are in there, you can bring out all the things, because it's all the human rights aspects that are in there, in terms of um, we have to give people that the treaty requires, um, you know, the highest attainable levels of, of, of health, you know, and that includes smokers. All these things are in there. Um, and that's why, you know, it's really important, I think, to separate the WHO from the FCTC document. They're different things, and, and the document comes from what governments put forward. And so in this context, if that's been there as a recommendation, it's almost like use it as a good one rather than thinking it's a bad thing. That's a really good point. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, just before we ask the panellists what they think about, as an anorak, an FCTC <laughs> anorak, um, how confident are you that the UK will send a delegation in November well, that it's going to be strong on harm? Clive's point, um, he said, you know, they can be encouraged and pushed, and they need to be encouraged and pushed, and, and it's almost like, you know, who's watching and saying, do mm. what, what they want? I mean, in all the cops that I went to in the past, you know, if someone was there watching what a government was doing or saying, you know, then they sort of felt compelled. And that's why it's so useful to have people on a government delegation that almost can keep that government delegation honest. And that's why it's important, really, to have maybe, you know, a couple of... It's normal diplomatic practice, whether it's a trade mission or any other mission, to take at least two NGOs. WHO discourages it for this but UK has every right to put on its delegation. If you put someone on there who, you know, maybe someone we know in the harm reduction area who can make sure that the government does what it's supposed to, because it's watching it, because it can come back and say, UK government didn't do what it said it was going to. It didn't stand up for its own, um, I mean, China and, um, you know, China and Japan, will, you know, and, and, and Cuba and others will all stand up for their rights in that. It only takes one or two governments, and of course, it's absence of formal objection, no voting. So they, it, things will pass easily 
if, if one or two governments say it and if the others just say nothing. And that's why all these things that have come along, it's not that governments agreed to do it, it's just that they said nothing. So, so you know, dodgy things that Turkmenistan or Syria or something is put forward, maybe um, encouraged by the WHO to do, you know, in UK, in Europe, whatever, is just let it, let it go because it's that we're not going to do it, doesn't worry us in the UK. And that's, but then take that mindset of decision making and use it to advantage. Um, but anyway, I'll talk more about that later. Okay, on, on that, I, 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 this is a drag out in the back of my mind. I seem to remember recently a parliamentary question went in um, from someone asking um, the Under Secretary of State, Joe Churchill, if they will take to COP9 a, a harm reduction expert or consumer. Yeah. Uh, and the answer came back to something like, uh, this is a high level meeting, it will be basically white hall mandarins who will be going to this thing. So, what Junior said there, firstly, how do you watch? WHO say you're being watched when we're not allowed to watch <laughs> their, their proceedings. And, um, and is it worth pushing again for this idea of having a harm reduction expert to go along to The Hague in November? Yeah, and I vote for Clive to go. Um, <laughs> no chance. <It's> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's, it's, it's deeply concerning that consumers aren't in any way involved in COP9. Um, normally, when other subjects come up, you know, patients or consumers are very important and they're just completely ignored. And, and the idea that this, the COP is in any way clean is just ridiculous. You know, we know that China itself owns large amounts of the tobacco industry and then every single government gains huge amount of taxation from, um, from cigarettes. So they're all uh, at risk of um, being influenced by things. Um, I mean, I think the thing that puts Britain at, in a, in a different category is the fact that we have a Department of Health and we have a public um, uh, national health service. And so, and one of our biggest allies is uh, the Department of Health. Because if, say, as we talk about the, the taxation of vaping liquids come up, um, now the, you can push the Department of Health to say this will be bad for us because long-term costs. Because um, the Treasury really, we're frank about it, the Treasury wins from people smoking. I think their revenue is around 12 billion. The Department of Health, it costs them three billion. So we're lucky they're separate departments. And in other countries where you've got private health uh, companies and the governments don't really care for the costs of, of, of smoking so much. Um, and uh, I don't know if you've seen recently that the World Health Organization on a different subject came out in a draft paper saying that women of childbearing age shouldn't drink. Oh, God, yeah. And, and I was I think, just like, can you get even worse? Yeah, and I think it shows the sort of the style of thinking they have, which is to control the way people live their lives. And I think, frankly, you know, coming out of COVID, people are fed up with it. Yeah. I think people could understand why we needed restrictions to, to save yeah. us. But after this, I think we should push hard and say, you know, let's, let's have our freedom. Um, and I, I completely agree, you know, I worked, when I was in South I worked in the wine industry, and we did some, uh, I did some volunteering for a uh, fetal alcohol syndrome charity. So I completely understand the, the horrors of it. But the idea you're going to tell women of childbearing age to not drink, um, I think is abysmal. And hopefully so we can get the feminists on side against the WHO. <laughs> yeah, there, was already, there was already quite a strong response that I read on that mm. that was um, basically pointing to the evidence. Mm. Um, because as I was told when I was pregnant, um, they can't, you, basically what you can say is if you drink very heavily, that's a really, really bad idea. If you drink a little bit of alcohol, for most people, that doesn't make any difference. There are some people for whom it does have an impact, a very small number of people. So the only risk-free option, this is why you're pregnant, not just why you're mm -hmm. aged 18 to 45, mm -hmm. um, is to not drink at all. But the wet midwives do not tell you, you cannot mm -hmm. drink, otherwise you will harm your baby, because that isn't true. But they give you, they say like, this is the evidence base, and you make your decision. It's very handmaid's tale, wasn't it? No, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's about, yeah, just, just what you said. I mean, Consumers International is an accredited WHO NGO, which means whenever I was watching, Consumers International sees vacant, there's no one there. International Chamber of Commerce is also an accredited, um, um, accredited in order to be accredited to the WHO, that's how you get access to go yeah. in there. Um, so yeah. there's lots of there's lots of um, accredited NGOs mm. with accreditation to the WHO. Yeah, the, uh, Consumers International is 
it's actually dropped off the list. But can I just say something about this? Because the one, one of the, I, there's there's a snowball's chance in hell that the UK will put um, a, a THR advocate on the delegation. They've never done it before, and they'll not do it now. However. I think they, sh they could press for more transparency in, in the process. And one, one of the things that I did for evidence to the APPG uh, inquiry into, into, into uh, WHO was to compare the arrangements for observers that there is in the UN FCTC and, uh, sorry, the WHO FCTC and the UN FCCC, the Climate Convention. And it's the, the, the problem, and this was a problem with Consumers International as well, is that basically to get accreditation you have to be selected by the secretariat and you kind of have to pledge allegiance mm -hmm. to the treaty and the you have to have you have to report on the things that you're doing to implement the treaty and you have to be basically be uh, endorsed by the cop as a whole you you actually you know anyone can object to you so the problem is there's an extremely severe selection filter on who can come in. And actually, Consumers International at the time were not functioning as a, a consumers uh, organization. They were funding as a, a tobacco control organization that actually had uh, a, n a number of, of quite um, you know, fundamentalist tobacco control types recommended. And they've now they, they've lapsed and they've now dropped off the agenda and they no longer have um, accreditation. But the, prob the problem is in, sorry, it's not a problem, in the climate convention, you just have to show that you have a professional interest in this. And you can be contrarian, you could be the coal industry, you could be the auto industry, the airline industry, you can be, um, you can be someone who doesn't think there should be a treaty at all, you could be someone who's a complete climate change denier, um, or you could be a deep green that thinks that the, the climate convention is too weak and useless and you know, we, there ought to be a global government, whatever. As long as you have a, a sort of professional standing, and, 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 therefore, and therefore the number of observers and diversity observers there is in the climate convention is huge compared to the sort of narrow in-group that, uh, that sort of forms a kind of echo chamber around the delegates in the uh, framework convention on climate change. With, increasingly severe measures to exclude dissonant voices, including the public and the press and um, anyone with a, a THR kind of agenda, simply not even allowed into the proceedings at all now. And I, I think that's an area where the UK could play a role in sort of more democratizing that convention and making sure that it's more accountable and more transparent, because it doesn't live by its own principles of transparency at all. Okay. On, on that subject, as we're talking about the UK here, uh, let's let's imagine that in November COP9 comes out and it's it's hideously pro, uh, full of prohibition and everything mm -hmm. else. We shouldn't be bothered about that in, in this country because we're not we're not going to move our policies, are we? I mean, why should it bother us? I mean, it, well, I get this from consumers. They say, yeah. why, why are we bothered? The UK government is fine. They're not going to change their plan. It doesn't matter what they say in COP9. It doesn't matter what the EU does. We're not going to change anything. Why, why should we be worried about any of this? I think it just, yeah. I was gonna say, it just gives ammunition to other people, to opponents. That's mm. that's why I, I, mm. that's my initial reaction. It just gives ammunition to others. I mean, there's already a narrative that the UK is a kind of weird outlier, and you know, ministers ministers don't like that. They like to be leading, but they don't like to be diverging. If you say heading off in a different direction, and the other thing is. We should be internationalist, and we should have a view of the, you know, whatever it is, seven, eight million dead a year, um, the billion smokers, uh, the businesses that could prosper from this. You know, uh, you know, why, why shouldn't we t take an interest? The, the main, the main problem with it. I mean, the, the WHO doesn't really command anyone to do anything. It, it's, it's a, largely a framework, mostly advisory, but what it is is norm setting. And it provides us what's, what your policymakers call a, an authorising environment to do bad things like prohibition or something. The, the, nothing in the WHO or the FCTC requires you to prohibit um, e-cigarettes, but there's a lot in the decisions, the working papers uh, from the FCTC, uh, the, the guidelines from the FCTC that encourage you to prohibit. And if you're an official in, you know, in, a, in a, a country that's looking to do something like that, you can find lots of reasons to do it, 
in the FCTC documents and documentation, not in the treaty itself, but in the documentation that surrounds it, and in the statements of WHO, and in the way they hand out prizes and so on. And I think the problem is that if we just ignore that, that will crowd in around Europe, it will, um, it will create, it will make the UK more and more out of line with others, and then, and then the health community will get uncomfortable and will drag us back towards the sort of regression towards the mean. Yeah. Okay, has anyone else got any questions? Oh, Louise, yeah. Thanks. I was really struck yesterday by the theme of those personal stories making a difference to um, policymakers' minds. And um, I know, you know, millions of stories have been gathered uh, over, over the last few years from consumers, but uh, is this the time that the NNA, for instance, could, could you know, gather more stories and present those? Uh, in, in the hope of changing more minds. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in the minds of the, of the health family, if you like, who are the biggest um, uh, obstacles very often to people switching. You know, in the stop smoking services, we, you know, we, we tell people they should be switching to a less harmful product and then they go and see their cancer specialist or their spiritual mm -hmm. physician who say, no, they're worse for you than cigarettes. Mm -hmm. you know, and then the stories, you know, is this the time to actually, um, you know, start Rebecca, when you were an MEP for TPD2 or an advanced TPD2, um, I expect you started getting quite a few emails. About yeah, <laughs> about I did, these and that is, yeah, that is actually why I looked into it because at the beginning I didn't know much about e-cigarettes because most people didn't. I didn't even know what they were, um, and it was actually that it was emails from individual people. It wasn't any organised campaign. They weren't all telling the same thing, but they were all telling essentially the same story which is, I smoked for 20 years, got health problems, tried to give up loads of times, failed. Someone gave me an e-cigarette and, oh my God, it's like 15 months and I had a cigarette now I can play football with my kids and, you know, my doctor said my blood pressure's gone, all these, all these things. Um, and that's what made me, like, okay, I need to look into this in more detail um, because I, I didn't know, uh, I didn't know the area, I didn't know the issues. So that is exactly what made me look into it. Um, and I would also say, because I work for a women's health charity now, and that is one of the most powerful things that we use, is the voice of women with endometriosis standing there in Parliament and saying, you know, it took 15 years for me to get a diagnosis, and doctors were telling me it's all in my head in that time. You know, because that, that happens. That happens to a lot of people. Um, and we have those, we work with some of our volunteers who are spokespeople who will go on the media and, and tell their stories. Uh, and that is very powerful. Mark, you've, with WeVape, you've been trying to uh, bring in voices from uh, vapors, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you often speak to people, and, and the consultation TRPR is a perfect example. You know, it's a pretty horrible consultation to try and do for, for I'm sure, everyone on this panel, let alone the, you know, your everyday consumer. And people were coming to me and saying, no, I, can't, I can't, I've given up, I can't do this. And I just said, no, others have done the same. Just answer question 13 and just tell them. You know, you used to smoke 20 cigarettes a day and you couldn't quit and you tried multiple times. So no, it is really important. And, um, and politicians will listen um, when they hear those personal stories and, and also reminding politicians that vapors vote and it's an important part of their vote. And I, I commissioned a, a poll on this. It haven't released yet. So you're all hearing this uh, for the first time off the press. Um, and the question was, did the EU's position on vaping have any influence on the way you voted in the EU referendum? So this was just at vapors. And 35% said yes. So that's, that's quite a lot. It's quite a lot of influence it had. And um, you know, I, I think there's 150 MPs in the, in the UK that have less than 5,000 uh, majority. And, um, and there's most constituencies that have around 6,000 vapors. So you know, we're an important lot, so we need to put pressure on them and remind them. Um, and I certainly will be doing that, and I think with COP9, pushing the government um, to recognise these individual stories. And really, this means, COP9 means that UK vapours, 
they're not just fighting for vaping for in our country, but as sort of Clive said, we're fighting for other people around the world, which is it's fantastic. Sensible approach, sensible approach. We've got time. To, go on, very, very quick. I mean, I, I think sometimes vapors think, well, if I just tell my story, that's not proper science, and this is all about proper science. That's just that needs to be laid to rest. Yeah. The strongest evidence is the account of somebody who has had undergone a successful transition and attributes it, attributes it to vaping. And it's not an unscientific idea, this. I mean, the, the medical literature is full of case reports in which you learn something from something's happened. When you have 10,000 case reports that all say basically the same thing, that is very strong evidence, okay? It's not not scientific. It's only unscientific because it's labelled as such by people who find it inconvenient rather than unscientific. So that's the first thing to say. The second thing is that these testimonies activate a whole different bit of brain circuitry to scientific discourse about odds ratios and um, uh, you, you know elasticities and all of that kind of stuff. And the, the circuitry that's activated is empathy. It's that people can actually feel your experience, and un, uh, good politicians can anyway, understand your experience and sort of uh, it, it kind of internalize what's happened to you and why, why it matters. And I think um, I was amazed. The, uh, the first exposure I had to this in the vaping side, and this is uh, this is happened before I got involved actually, was in 2010. And the, the government, UK government, tried to um, saw vaping products were coming up on the market and had a proposal which is like do nothing, regulate as medicines straight away or re regulate as medicines in a year or something like that. And completely out of the blue, there was about 1,200 um, responses to this from, va from vapors, basically, which were all kind of, you know, badly spelled and poorly typed and, you know, um, there was nothing slick about them at all. But having browsed through them, they were incredibly compelling because they, they, they had an amazing authenticity about them because they were authentic. Yeah. Um, it wasn't like a Friends of the Earth, oh, here's 10,000 postcards that all say the same, that involve minimal effort. These were all telling visceral, personal stories about their experience. And this is in 2010. That was replicated at far greater scale in 2013 in the, in the uh, kind of lobbying activity in the European Parliament. And frankly, it's going to have to be done again. Um, in multiple theatres. But Louise, you're totally on it. it. It is the most compelling and most important evidence that can be put into the political system. Officials like the European Commission or the Civil Service quite capable of ignoring that or boiling it down to a silly pie chart of you know how many responses they've had. But politicians, it gets them in the gut if they're good politicians, and yeah. so it should, because that's the voice of their constituents telling them about something that matters. And if you get 10 letters on a subject uh, and they're each authentic and each individually written, that gets the attention in any politician's office. And if it's, if it's more than 10, then they start to know that there's something to really pay attention to. Yeah, I, there's, I just there's had actually... this experience with a, a, a relatively new MP who was elected um, 2019 for the first time. And he, had, he put a question in Parliament about endometriosis because he had someone, one of our volunteers, go, you know, contact him and tell her story. And he's now joined our APPG. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> um, and he referred to doctors gaslighting women. Mm. Mm. You know, so it, it definitely has an impact on him. There, there was a quote, I think it was George Galloway said when he was MP for Brent, was it, at the time? He said if they had five letters on a subject from their constituents, they held a meeting about it. So, you know, it doesn't take much to sway things. We've got time literally for one last question. It was, to be honest, it was just built on that point. I think Clive mentioned earlier about the ecosystem of um, influences. And you mentioned the fiscal, the regulatory, and the information. But I think the emotion and the storytelling, I think mm. that you're right, is the absolute, it's almost like the bit we, we kind of forget about. And I wonder if there's a bit more we, we could and should be doing around around that area to really kind of help push this while we've got these doors that are open at the moment, especially obviously after everything that we've kind of been through as a, as a nation and as a, as a globe. I mean, Lindsay, Lindsay Stroud in the, in the US has done an amazing thing. She's got, I don't know how many she's got, must have like, it seemed like a hundred or a million of these sort of quick piece to camera things from sort of gruff old vapors, basically, in the middle age looking a bit sort of rough. 
saying, you know, I've switched to vaping and it's saved my life. And by the way, I use key lime pie and jelly fruit uh, flavor, and it's just totally excellent. And, uh, and every time some idiot from the WHO or, or the CDC says some, says some stupid tobacco control mantra, they'll get about five of these things in their Twitter feed directly below, you know, because she's, she's on it. She's basically saying that the story here can be told through the testimony and lived experience of actual people. You don't need to do some regression analysis of the PATH data set to find truth because everybody knows for every study that shows it's bad, there's a study that shows it's good. But the, the, the vocalization of the lived experience is a kind of form of unassailable evidence. Okay, we're going to have, we have to wrap up. So I'll just ask you very brief, for a very brief answer to a, a final question. We're talking about the future of harm reduction in the UK. So is it positive? Um, should I mean I, I'm, I sometimes feel a bit guilty in this country when you look at other countries how how, yeah. how lucky we are. But you know, is it positive? Is there going to be change? And um, and very briefly, I think we basically discussed it. What can consumers do to make sure it is positive in the future? Just very quick answer. Okay, it's very positive. The 2030 target is a massive, a massive asset for us. The Brexit deregulation and the levelling up agenda also help. We've got a strong set of proposals, we've got good products, we've got well-informed consumers, we've basically got uh, a lot of the health organisations on side for at least some of it. Um, so if we do what's necessary to meet that target, the only way to do it is to do it through tobacco harm reduction and mass switching of the current base of smokers into smoke-free products. That means, I think, in terms of advocacy, say three things, tell, you, tell your story, get busy, there's no letter, there's nothing that a vapor can't do, write into the local paper, write into their MP, but also join an association, because they'll help you direct your energies into the right place at the right time with the right sort of messages to try and get the right moment in a political process. Anything you want to say that? I mean, yeah, it's pretty much what Clive said, to be honest. I think we are in a positive position, and there are a lot of opportunities. So the question will be how, how to exploit those opportunities. And I think the public engagement, and as well the stakeholder engagement, because even if people aren't going to be supportive, as long as they won't oppose, that's fine. And I think that's where your work is. In terms of, you know, sort of public and stakeholder engagement, that's where your work is. Yeah. And lastly, Mark? I think it is positive, but the steps have to be taken now. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand, the TRPR consultation, as bad as it was, I heard from the Department of Health, we had 6,000 people respond. Mm -hmm. So that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we've got a lead in the world. Uh, and. and we are very lucky in the UK, and sometimes that can be difficult. When I go and speak to vapors, people are very relaxed about it. I know a lot of the vape reviewers, you try and get them interested in some drinks, and sometimes they say, oh, we'll be fine. I've heard some of them saying, oh, we're just going to get rid of TPD because we're left for the EU. No, we have to fight for, for changes. Um, and um, and we are, we've got to recognise we're that beacon. And if we continue to be that beacon, and I know people in Sweden are very keen for us to legalise snooze, and if we show the EU, if we can see that massive divergence happen as we legalise snooze and we take people off smoking, then that will have an impact around the world. Um, maybe the EU will think twice about their policies. Okay. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, we're going to have to wrap up here because um, I've got a lot of foot back for, the, um, for something there. Um, but I hope you give an appreciation for that. What's going on with this one?